Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. I see some of you are still joining or connecting to audio. Um, we're super happy to have you today um, on this afternoon, getting close to the weekend. So hopefully you all are excited for that. Um, today, we are super excited to have um, the California Association of Local Behavioral Health Boards and Commissions. Um, and so I'm just gonna do a very quick um, welcome and then pass it over to our CEO, Jessica, who will introduce our speaker for today. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, so many of you, if you've already participated in our town halls, you know that we've been using this polling software. Um, it's really easy to utilize, so you can either open a new browser on your computer, um, or you can use your smartphone and just go ahead and type in menti.com. And if, um, yeah, the so you'll see the code up here on the top. It's 518543 um, and I can go ahead and drop it into the chat box as well. So the code again is 518543 once you go to menti.com. And that will allow you to participate in our polls and they will populate in real time. So um, you can use that or if you're not able to get onto Menti for whatever reason, definitely feel free to continue using the chat. All right, so my name is Brianna Vargas and I'm the Director of Community Engagement and I'm just gonna go over some quick house rules. Um, I like to call them community agreements. Um, folks call them you know, different ways, but it's basically just to open up the space and say, you know, we wanna create this safe space for folks you know, coming in at all different levels of understanding, um, specifically what CalBHBC does. Um, some of you maybe um, have worked with them in the past or maybe well, very well versed in what they do. And some of you, this may be kind of the first time hearing um, from the uh, CalBHBC. So just be kind and courteous, listen attentively and with an open mind, speak honestly and share the space. We'll actually have um, a component at the end for a discussion uh, where you can come off mute um, because um, the directors um, and the leadership, um, including Teresa at CalBHBC, would like to hear um, from you all um, on some things that they're kind of wondering about um, in regard to the community. Um, and so learning leaves, but names stay. We wanna just keep everything confidential, especially if folks are sharing during that discussion time or sharing their personal stories during the Q&A. Um, step up, step back. If you're noticing that you're um, sharing a lot, that's great, um, but maybe just we wanna give space for everyone to be able to share what's on their mind, either through the chat box or later on in the discussion um, by coming off of mute. Um, and then reserve the right to change your mind. Um, that is kind of linked to the fact that this is recorded. You know, some folks uh, change their mind about how much they wanna share with us, um, knowing that it, it is recorded. Um, but this is just for anyone who couldn't join us today. That way they still have access to the material as well. So just that note, and then we do have um, our first Mentimeter question. So hopefully some of you are logged on. I saw some of you were hitting those emojis already. So that's great. So just letting us know what county are you joining us from? And again, if you're not participating through Menti, you can go ahead and enter that into the chat box. Like Janet just did. Thank you, Janet. Here from Amador. And then we have San Diego, Solano County, um, Calaveras, Tulare. LA, Sacramento, Santa Clara, San Gabriel Valley. So this is just to get a better sense of who's in the space. Um, we have folks joining us from across the state, as you can see um, into the chat, I see Ventura, San Mateo. So that's great. Um, super excited to have a lot of representation from across the state um, and to have you all here in the same space today. All right, next slide. And now if you could um, identify your role. And you can check all of uh, all that apply on this question. So are you a family member, a peer, a mommy affiliate, staff or volunteer? Are you from a community-based organization? Are you a provider, a student? Go ahead and check all that applies so that we know who's in the space. And this one's really exciting for us because I think it helps us to see like now that we're in this new virtual space, usually, you know, you'd have time to kind of network and see who else is in the room with you. Um, so this is exciting for us to still see, you know, if you identify as a family member, parent or caregiver to see I'm not the only family member, parent or caregiver on this call. There are 
um, various others as we see here. Awesome. And then I do see some in the chat as well. Thank you for sharing NAMI affiliates and family member and conservator. Thanks for sharing that component. Awesome. Great. So yeah, we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, and I'll just go ahead and pass it over to our CEO, Jessica Cruz, who has been instrumental in kind of developing the town halls um, and get, gathering state agencies so that um, we can kind of come together and answer a lot of the pressing questions that you all have. So Jess, go ahead. Thanks, Brianna. And thank you to you and Ragini and for all the NAMI California staff for really putting all the details of the town hall. Um, I will get these ideas and then we as a team kind of just make them happen. And so I think we're like on our seventh or eighth town hall and we're super excited because, and some of you have been on our calls, literally every single one from the beginning. And this might for others be your first time. So welcome and thank you for spending some time with us today. We're really excited to have our speaker from the California Association of Local Behavioral Health Boards and Commissions, Teresa Comstock with us today. We started our partnership a couple of years ago when we held a joint advocacy day together at the Capitol. And a lot of you may have come and joined us for that advocacy day. Um, and a lot of our, uh, board, our NAMI members are members of the, the local behavioral health boards and commissions. And so really our missions align a lot in the work that we do and the advocating um, for families and individuals that are living with the severe mental illness across the state. So Teresa, thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. I know you have a couple of your own board members that are also going to join you, but let me just kind of give everybody a quick brief um, background. So Teresa serves as the executive director for the, the local behavioral health boards and commission, commissions association of California. She's also a governor appointed member of the state rehabilitation council. And she is a member of the Napa County mental health board. So we're very excited to have you here today with us and welcome to NAMI California, Teresa. Thank you very much. And I'm gonna actually um, just introduce our president and she just um, wanted to to speak briefly and then I'll go through the presentation. Um, so Cal BHBC's president is Dr. Harriet Stevens. Um, she is on the San Francisco Mental Health Board. Um, she's a past co-chair of that board. Um, she also is the chair of the Mental Health Education Fund um, organization in San Francisco, a member of the San Francisco National Alliance on Mental Health. And she's a published author of educational um, articles and books. Um, Harriet, are you able to um, unmute? And uh, thank you, Teresa. And good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the California Association of Local Behavioral Health Boards and Commissions, thank you so much for taking the time today for this town hall. We appreciate the opportunity to connect with you and we very much appreciate your role in mental health advocacy, both in your local communities and statewide. Cal BHBC's mission is to support the work of California's 59 local mental and behavioral health boards and commissions by providing resources, training and opportunities for communication and statewide advocacy. As mentioned, our di executive director, Teresa Comstock, will provide the PowerPoint presentation this afternoon. Benny Benavides and I will be available following the presentation for questions and discussion. Again, thank you so much for connecting with us today. Thank you. Um, and uh, Betty Benavides, yes, he will be able to join us, I think, for a question and answer later. Um, and I also want to mention that I, I noticed some other governing board members for Cal BHBC that are um, um, participating today. I see Bill Stewart, who is on the commission in San Diego, and then um, Linda Kaufman who is on um, the Santa Cruz uh, Behavioral Health Commission. So thanks for joining us. And I, 
I also recognize some others from boards and commissions around California. So it's good to see everybody. Um, and again, um, we very much appreciate the opportunity co to connect with you. And um, we so appreciate your role in terms of mental health advocacy for yourselves, your family members in local communities and statewide. Um, let's go on to the next slide. So I'm just gonna give you an overview of uh, you know, what we do as an association, what the boards and commissions do um, and the advocacy issues that we've um, raised up um, for the past year to work on um, uh, the Cal BHBC leadership our governing board has identified. Um, so let's, um, let's start with the duties. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so the 59 local mental and behavioral health boards and commissions around California are in California statute. And we have specific duties um, that we're mandated to do. Um, of course, we are advisory boards and commissions. So that's a, that's a big part of what we do, advising. Uh, we should be reviewing and advising regarding mental health needs, services, facilities, and special problems throughout the community. Uh, we should, the second bullet point um, speaks to involvement of other advocacy organizations. Um, we should be ensuring that citizen and professional involvement is part of all the planning, not just MHSA, but all of the planning for mental and behavioral health in the communities. Um, you know, these are public boards, they should be serving the public and they should be open and they um, should be really ensuring that there is a good process in order to listen to the voices of individuals from NAMI and other organizations. Um, review and comment on local performance outcome data to the state. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about performance outcome data later. Um, you would think that, that this would be something um, that could easily be done with all the data out there right now, um, but that's an, an item that we're advocating for. We haven't seen standardized data. Um, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about our advocacy. Uh, we are um, supposed to be part of the process of appointment of the mental health director. The Board of Supervisors in each county um, appoints the, the mental health or behavioral health directors and the boards and commissions should have some um, uh, part of that process, usually um, interviewing, going through some of the applications, um, you know, making sure that um, the consumer family member voice and stakeholder voice is part of that process and then assessing the impact of realignment. I'll just keep going. You're, you're welcome to ask questions if you like as we go along. All right, so uh, in terms of duties for the Mental Health Services Act, um, the assuring citizen and professional involvement is a big piece of that. And there's something called community program planning which we, we offer training um, to our boards and commissions. And I, I know that the, the counties really try to um, provide that type of process, but it's very different in every single county. Um, what we decided to do was just put together a one pager to describe what are the requirements according to the law um, it's, it's pretty squirrely if you try to look through all the different California Welfare and Institution Code regulations, they point all these different directions. Um, we decided to just condense it onto one page so that um, the staff and the boards and commissions would know what are the requirements for the stakeholders um, in terms of you know, what, who are the stakeholders um, and who the other participants should be and that should be underserved individuals and there should be demographic diversity. And then it also um, outlines the process. 
uh, let's see, we um, as boards and commissions should be reviewing and advising regarding the Mental Health Services Act plans and updates. Um, and in the last year, I guess it's been less than a year, there was some legislation that went into place that um, required counties um, to respond if we made substantive recommendations. And that means if we have a majority vote on a recommendation regarding the MHSA plans, um, that the, either the staff needs to incorporate that into the plan or they need to respond and um, analyze and kind of summarize and tell the Board of Supervisors and the Department of Healthcare Services why they did not implement that recommendation. And we also conduct the public hearing, which should happen 30 days, um, at least 30 days after the, the new plans and updates are drafted. All right, let's go to the next. The membership of the boards and commissions, uh, there's a requirement that 50% should be family members or consumers. And of that 50%, 20% must be consumers. Um, that would be, mean individuals with lived experience of mental illness um, and 20% should be family members. Um, there should be one board of supervisor member on every board and commission. And these boards and commissions should reflect the diversity of the community that they serve. Uh, and then also they should be um, trying to include individuals from all the different sectors that intersect with mental health, such as education, police, um, hospitals. All right, let's go to the next. All right, so top issues. Um, so, as I mentioned before, performance outcome data, that might not sound like the sexiest topic to advocate for, but we found that it is a very meaningful topic. Um, you know, when, when um, I was in community organizing, um, this was about 20 years ago, um, you know, we used to talk about, you know, trying to get money for a certain projects um, and we'd advocate to maybe city councils or, or board of supervisors. Um, and we had one leader within our organization that would say to us, if, if those public officials say there's no money for, for that project, what they mean is there's no money for you. Um, and in terms of data, I think we could say the same thing. Um, you know, right now we're hearing there's there's no performance outcome data um, and what that means to us is that there's no data for us we know there's lots and lots of data um, but the the state has not done their role in terms of identifying and communicating um, and standardizing so that we can really tell the story of the impact of the the services that are provided. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we've done in that area. Um, the other item on this slide talks about the top behavioral health issues that uh, we've identified to work on this year. They all inter intersect each other. Um, workforce, uh, residential care facilities, the board and care issue, um, crisis care continuum, um, employment, and children and youth, um, including foster and school-based services. So let's go on to the next item. So in terms of, the, back to the, the, sexy, the sexy advocacy item, the performance outcome data. Um, so what we did was we went through all of the MHSA plans and updates for the counties, the most recent ones, and we identified what actually is being reported, even though it's reported differently. Um, and um, some counties don't report much at all. Some counties report some really meaningful information regarding their programs and the impacts um, in these five categories, children and youth, criminal justice, employment, 
hospitalization and housing. Um, in terms of children and youth, they're showing from their mental health programs um, that they're um, improving attendance, uh, improving behavior in the classroom, improving self-reported wellness. Uh, Nevada County in particular had some um, good data that they were collecting and reporting. Um, all of these um, counties have some data and actually we have data for every single county. It's just that this page right here tells you the ones that are really reporting the most data and the most meaningful data um, that we think that maybe they would be good examples going forward. Um, for criminal justice, um, these counties, if, if they're implementing successful full service partnership um, programs, we're seeing some counties that have decreased the recidivism rate so that, that people within those programs are not re returning to jail or prison at all. So some of these counties have brought it down to 0% uh, incarceration for individuals um, that are in the MHSA FSP programs. Employment, we know that employment is a major therapeutic tool. Um, it's a big part of wellness. Um, and when we see programs that work, um, it's so important to be able to communicate that um, and scale that throughout the state. Um, Alameda County is really taking the lead and we see other counties, um, especially Imperial, Los Angeles, and Solano counties um, reporting on that type of data related to, these are programs within the Mental Health Services Act that have um, specific programs to provide employment or vocational services to individuals with mental illness that are um, getting people into sustained and competitive employment. Hospitalization, uh, that means that um, um, people are um, reducing the rehospitalization rates um, in a substantial way. And um, housing, uh, in terms of housing, they're tracking uh, our people being able to maintain um, stable and permanent housing. All right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so this year has been really a transformational year in terms of legislation in California. Um, and these are the areas where Cal, uh, Cal BHBC um, leadership supported bills uh, the ones that are in bold are the ones that we supported. And then I, I also added other bills that, that really um, seem to be part of those categories that we were advocating for, even though they, they weren't ones that we took the lead with. Um, so peer certification, we were glad to join um, in support of SB 803. Um, and this was the third year that we supported a similar bill. Um, so we're, we're real pleased to see that that's in place and know that that will make a big difference in terms of um, adding more um, substance to peer certification support um, and standardization and being able to pull down Medi-Cal dollars for that. Um, we also noticed that the nurse practitioners um, there, there were some changes in order to allow them to provide um, more independent service for the mental health workforce. Um, residential care facilities, um, there are a couple of bills related to that. We know that for a number of people, you know, that are, are kind of cycling through the system into homelessness or incarceration or just through hospitalization and the emergency rooms that that part of it is that they can't maintain stable housing independently and they really need a boarding care. Um, so we're 
we're very interested in seeing this um, issue move forward and glad to see some legislation in that area this year. And then crisis care continuum for all ages. Um, and actually the boarding care issue certainly and the workforce issue all um, relate with that too. Um, but um, in particular this year, we were very glad to support the um, SB 855 to increase access and parity, um, especially um, requiring private insurance to step up. And then we also noticed the um, Dolores Law legislation um, had passed, um, which means that individuals um, or uh, counties are now um, uh, part of the Loris Law unless they decide to opt out instead of opting in. All right, go to the next slide. And then on the federal level, this was the first year Cal BHBC leadership decided to, um, to uh, support some uh, legislation in this area. And I, I don't have a lot of expertise on the federal level, but um, we were glad to see that finally the, the, the bill requiring the 988 um, phone number for suicide hotline um, that the bill was signed just, I think maybe it was just last week. So we were glad to see that happen. And then we also advocated um, for some funding partly due to COVID-19 and then also with the Crisis Stabilization and Community Reentry Act. Okay, next slide. All right, so I got through what we do and what we've been working on. Um, you know, mostly the reason that um, I said yes and that our leadership wanted to be part of this teleconference was mostly to hear from you. Um, so I'm hoping that um, we can get a little bit of discussion and, and hear from the folks on the teleconference in terms of what are your, your top issues, gaps, or successes that you see um, in your local communities. And um, I also wanted to check is uh, Benny Benavides, are you on the line? I'm not sure if he's made it on. Okay then I'll probably be the one to be answering any questions or, you know, I'm glad to answer questions related to what I presented or if you have some um, input in terms of this discussion question. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Teresa. And yeah, as we mentioned, um, feel free to type in um, your response to this discussion uh, question in the chat box. Or we'd also love to hear from you if you'd like to verbalize some of your thoughts. Um, you can let us know by um, raising your hand. Um, you have that option in your um, participant portal. Um, that way we can see. Um, or you can just you know, mention in the chat, like, hey, I'd like to come off of mute, um, just so that we don't have folks speaking over each other um, or trying to connect at the same time. But yeah, definitely um, feel free to um, type up your answers or share out loud with us. Um, I did have a question. Yes. Um, it's more concerning uh, foster care group homes because um, there was a, a elimination of a lot of foster care group homes and there are some benefits, especially for a high school age youth getting into certain foster care homes. And in, in, in San Diego, there we have some that the youth have been, been coming more stable and productive. And since the closures, they just shut it down pretty much, even though they were very productive. So I just wanted to throw that out there because that's a huge concern, especially if you have um, a, a system or a program that's working for needed consumers. 
Thank you, Bill. I'm making a note about that. There's um, just today there was a presentation on children and youth and um, um, the MHSOAC um, Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission um, has put out a draft. I think it's finalized now on children and youth. Um, so I'm, I'm going through that now and you know, I'll keep your um, comment in mind too um, as we look at um, how to you know, just kind of encapsulate the different pieces of the issue with, with um, the different populations of children and youth and how we can do a better job of serving them. So thank you. Definitely, thank you, Bill. Um, and then I did have a question um, that came up in the chat. Um, could you please explain a bit more about the data that is collected and where are the gaps in collecting that data? Is there something that county boards can do to get more data to the commission? And who is, um, can you tell me what county that person? Lisa, I believe is Solano. In Solano County, oh, okay. And I think we have had, um, Solano had some good data in some areas, I think, that, that we've noticed. Um, so yeah, in terms of the data piece, each county is collecting different data right now. There are certain things that every county is the same on, and that's Medi-Cal data, um, what's called EQRO, um, external quality review organization, and, and they, they have certain requirements. Um, and that's where we can see the re-hospitalization rates. Um, so that's standard and each of the counties is reporting that. And we have that on our website. We have, um, and then we also have information on um, SAMHSA grants um, what's called the PATH grant that talks a, a little bit about performance in terms of employment and housing that is attached to the PATH grant money um, for those counties that have that grant. Um, and that's on our website. Each, each county in California, we've created a web page for them. And, and all, we've culled all the information that we could find on performance outcome data from their MHSA plans and added the Medi-Cal data and the SAMHSA um, PATH grant data to that as well. Um, so you can look at that for Solano County on our website. I think it would be um, calbhbc.org slash performance uh, slash um, Solano. And then, um, you know, as I said, we're, we're trying to advocate and we've just started noticing that the state agency is responsible um, by law to do this type of work are starting to step up and create a, a, a process so that stakeholders can be part of identifying what data points are collected and reported on. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to um, all be part of that, you know, NAMI. Um, hopefully can show up for those different stakeholder meetings with Department of Healthcare Services um, and the California Behavioral Health Planning Council um, who advises Department of Healthcare Services um, regarding mental health programs and alcohol and drugs. Um, they should be hosting hopefully maybe in January a forum so that uh, we can get input from the different state agencies but more importantly from stakeholders. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did, thank you. Okay, good. Awesome, great question, Lisa. Um, okay, I have another one here. Um, this individual says, concerned about dual diagnosis centers popping up without having psychiatric involvement. Uh, how are they allowed to advertise themselves as dual diagnosis? Not sure if you know the answer to that, Teresa. Right, yeah, that, that I do not have um, experience with that issue. So I'm just making a note of it. So there are dual diagnosis centers that um, they're saying that they're dual diagnosis, but they're really not, it sounds like. 
Um, so that's an and what issue. county is that in, Karen? What county are you in? LA County. In in LA. Oh, same from San Gabriel. Okay, that's a, a that's an interesting question for sure. Because it doesn't seem that they could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are. Yeah. They are, and and I'm wondering what what we can do to advocate for people who do have mental health and drug addiction problems and how we can get the information out to them to to say be careful about where you're going to be uh, getting your loved one or you're going to go in into this uh, uh, supposed dual diagnosis place where they have no psychiatrist so it's just like a, it's a sud place almost but no psychiatrist like um, nothing to to do the other side of it the psychiatric side yeah interesting exactly hmm. Teresa do you know how they could go about in advocating to you know bring that awareness like my initial response would be talk to you know Dr. Sharon in LA County but it seems like maybe could they go through various boards or bring this to their board as a way of um, like a point of knowledge and then the board can do something about that like how does that how does that work um well, the boards and commissions are supposed to be advising the board of supervisors and the behavioral health director. So if this, if these dual diagnosis centers are using public money, um, you know, they're, if they're, they have contracts with the behavioral health department, um, that local board, the LA or, the, or commission, the LA um, Mental Health Commission would be the, a good place to raise that issue. Um, but if it's all private money, um, there's a new bill, the SB 855 that I talked about that, um, that makes um, certain requirements um, so that insurance companies um, have to cover mental health the same way with parity and substance use um, as other health issues. And so there's um, a process going forward now with, I think it's Department of Managed Healthcare in California. I might have my, the wrong acronym in my mind right now, but they're, they're trying to create a mechanism now so that there's more oversight over um, the, the mental health and the drug and alcohol um, services and um, insurance um, coverage. Um, so that, that's something that's kind of in process right now, now that SB 855 was just passed. Um, so there may be a way, if, if that's all private funding for that, you know, probably in the next year or two, we'll start seeing some ways that we can um, increase the accountability and oversight for that. Great point to bring up. And thank you, Jess, for that follow-up question. Um, okay, so I have another one here, um, just a comment um, about the gaps in Orange County. Um, this individual um, is talking about a specific example. Um, the wrong file was given to an individual experiencing homelessness with schizophrenia. Um, so when he traveled across town and presented the file, the other organization would not help him because he came with the wrong file. And then they say, mind you, this person is not capable to handle his own affairs and needs coaching. Um, so another issue um, is also finding CIT trained or de-escalation officers, um, specifically for parents calling for crisis assistance at home in that county as well. Um, and she mentions that this was um, kind of shared and discussed um, in their NAMI support groups as um, issues that have been happening with families in Orange County. Okay, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, in terms of the CIT um, and the uh, de-escalation training for officers, um, so they're on our website, we, we do have the law in terms of what should be taking place. I'm, I'm sure probably NAMI probably offers that kind of information to, um, to your members. Um, yeah, all of these um, officers should be trained. 
Um, and so that might be something to bring up to the um, mental health board in Orange County also. Um, and I know that some counties, you know, they regularly will have a speaker um, that will um, just come and present to the board about the CIT and then that gives them the opportunity as a border commission to say, you know, are we, are, are each level of officers being trained? Is it, is it police? Is it sheriff? Is it the, the uh, law enforcement that are at our community colleges? You know, is it all across the board and are they all getting trained according to how they should be with the, you know, in terms of the law? Um, and then, um, I noticed there's a federal uh, piece of legislation um, that was that's um, looking to fund more of that type of, um, oh, it wouldn't be officers, but it would be mental health professionals that would be deployed from the police departments um, when, when it is a mental health crisis. So um, there's, there's something on the federal level that looks like it might be addressing that. So I appreciate that you brought up that issue just from my own notes. Um, and in terms of the, the individual that um, had the, the, the issue with um, showing up with the wrong file, that, that's, um, that's more of an individual issue, but I think, you know, mental health boards and commissions want to hear when there are issues like that. And, and if we know that it's a systemic problem, then we can really, you know, make some recommendations and try to get that sort of thing to stop. Um, the other place to go is also the patient's rights advocate in the area. Yeah, definitely. Great points, Teresa, and thank you for sharing that, Lana. Um, and then I just wanted to address, so um, Pat asked, how can I access the CPP one pager that was mentioned? And I did uh, drop that link into the chat. Um, so I, I did post it earlier, but again, since you all are commenting, um, I posted it again now. And then I also just posted, um, the website on CalBHBC's site that connects you to local boards and commissions uh, and their sites. Thanks, Brianna. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing any additional comments or questions. Um, so definitely feel free to continue using the chat if anyone wants to come off of mute and share um, your experiences with the issues, gaps, or successes related to mental behavioral health in your counties, in your cities? I thought I might respond um, to the comment that was made about the dual diagnosis uh, concern. I, I work within a dual diagnosis treatment and I do find the concern familiar. I, I think that that is a fair concern and um, it may be that um, I've seen it within sort of a drug medical system, possibly, uh, where there's a, a different sort of levels of care where people might be recognized as providing um, clinically managed services, but that that can be confused as to what that actually means. And uh, sometimes I think that can potentially be misrepresented misrepresented or construed to sound like it's a dual diagnosis, but uh, there is definitely a need in those circumstances to have uh, higher levels of, uh, to have professionals that can provide deeper degrees of uh, psychiatric care if it is that it would be a true co-occurring program. So I just wanted to reaffirm that concern and, and say that there is some truth to that, that I, within the field, have seen that and it, it, it can be something that I, I think would be valuable to have addressed. Um, Sarah, is it, um, is it in the public system or private system that you've seen this? I've seen this and I really have to be careful. I don't know. Um, how how much to say, but it can be within the public 
health system, yes. All right. I might be comfortable maybe chat, chatting a little bit offline or something about some of the concerns. Okay, uh, yeah. And, and if it is something that, that is seen in the public health system, that's something that should be raised, um, you know, to the awareness of the, the border commission locally, um, because there, there needs to be intentional programs or, or, well, what do we call them, navigators sometimes, or we call it um, warm handoffs, you know, but there has to be some method of getting people to the care that they need. You know, I think we're all trying to get closer to that whole person care model. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, you know, we have to do what, the, what we need to do to connect people to the right services, no matter what door mm -hmm. they come in. I have seen some linkages in those circumstances with a outpatient program that provides mental health services so that at least in those contexts, there is a linking to a psychiatrist uh, within the same sort of organization. Mm -hmm. Um, one other thing I don't want to monopolize things too much, but I did just want to mention was um, I'm connected to a, a community group that uh, it works to have like an integration of individuals with intellectual disabilities and um, and one of the things that we find as we're trying to meet it's a faith community is um, that during COVID, we've had a harder time actually connecting at times with some people who are not as comfortable using Zoom or things along those lines. And then there's, I guess, also the option of, um, uh, for people with Medi-Cal, uh, there's Lyft as a way to get transportation back and forth. But some of the tech requirements for people who have some intellectual disabilities sort of actually become barriers to utilization of these services that help them have contact with people. And so I was just wanting to sort of put that out on the table as, a, as an area where um, additional assistance would be appreciate or would be valuable. It's just people who in this moment in time, especially during sort of a tech transition, would have specific roles and just really helping to connect people and learn skills with them. How to utilize their, we've been doing a lot of that to help people learn how to connect virtually and to figure out how to use Lyft and things like that when there are those impairments that make it difficult to remember or to there just be hesitancy to use a computer for different reasons. I don't know if there's things that people have done in that domain. One thing that um, I wanted to mention is the Department of Rehabilitation. Um, I don't know if you're connected with them also, um, but you know they, their, their programs um, and the assistive technology that they can offer um, might be useful. You know, they, they really do have um, quite a bit of experience with individuals with intellectual disabilities. And also, um, you know, we're really advocating that they do more for individuals with what they call psychiatric disabilities or mental mm -hmm. illness. Um, that might be a good uh, way to connect. Mm -hmm. I'm the chair of the State Rehabilitation Council right now that, that advises Department of Rehabilitation. Um, so wow. I'm, you know, I'd be glad to kind of connect you. Um, there are 85 offices for DOR throughout California. So I'm sure there's you know, somebody local that you could be talking to across yeah. their contractors. Okay, yeah, we've definitely worked with the DOR, um, but maybe not as much in terms of how to utilize their assistance for this particular need during the time of COVID around uh, helping people with getting connected and utilizing it's sort of like a very big case management need right. in terms of getting to people's homes and saying do you have a computer and this is how you sync up your wi-fi and 
this is the different processes and uh, just really being very engaged in that particular way. Um, so I don't know how much, does DOR do a lot in terms of case management in the community? I'm more familiar with the services of going to the office itself. DOR, um, you know, since we're talking in the context of mental health, um, they have something they call mental health cooperatives. And uh -huh. so they partner with the behavioral health departments or mental health departments in the counties in uh -huh. order to provide services. And so they kind of braid together, you know, staff and funding. And, um, so that is, that's how they connect with mental health. Um, one other um, resource that I wanted to mention is there's something called the Digital Access Project. Um, and that is a way to get people connected that don't have, um, um, you know, that, that have some kind of a disability and don't have access to the internet or they don't have a tablet or something to use. And I think they could actually help um, get people with that um, going and there's um, assistive technology, which is what DOR offers too. So, um, you know, somehow getting getting connected with their counselors or their contractors or behavioral health and going that route with through the mental health cooperative might be the um, you know some some ideas. Okay. Let me see if I can. That's helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. I think if you Google digital access project, you'll find, I think it, that might be actually, it might be digitalaccessproject.org or something like that. Yeah. And then yeah. I'll bring you right to that. And then you can tell them what your needs are. Uh, yeah. And I dropped that link into the chat box. So you can okay. just click directly on it, Sarah. Excellent. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. I have a question. This is Dolores from Nami Temecula Valley. Hi, um, the, the challenges in our area over here in Riverside have been with teaching some of the classes to the peer classes because they don't have access to computers at all. A lot of them would like to join, but we can't since we're doing Zoom still right now. So we've had to do some drives and people donating some use computers and stuff. Um, I was wondering if um, we, we do have a benefactor, the Women's Club in Temecula that would like to give us some money to buy maybe some iPads that we could use for loaners when they're doing their classes. Is there, any, besides this digital access project, could that be a resource to maybe getting some tech for our peers? Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think that that's a, um, you know, it'd be a great connection if, if there is a mental health cooperative uh, program in place and you're trying to get these peer providers up and running too, especially if they're contracted through the county, there might be a, a really, um, you know, just kind of a natural mix between the Department of Rehabilitation and and the behavioral health division in terms of getting these peer provider classes, um, getting getting the technology that's needed for them, and yes. that, you know that digital access project, um, you know that that's certainly potentially a good source also. Yes, because they, they want to join the peer the peer classes that we're doing on Zoom and they just don't have the technology to do it. And so and and especially right now with them not having much to do, being involved. So we've had to do kind of like a phone call in thing, but then sometimes they don't have an, enough memory. I, it's just been a, um, a struggle trying to keep our our uh, classes together for them and keep their resources. So I'm definitely thanks for the resource and hopefully maybe I can get some iPads donated or something to keep That's them more, right. more connected. It's so important um, having so, so much depression and them trying to connect with us, trying to, and you know, we can't do it. So that's a challenge. Right. But, you know, it may be good to connect with them 
you know, the Behavioral Health Division, the Riverside, or and or DOR. I don't know if there's a mental health cooperative there or not. There, I think there might be, mm -hmm. um, but that might be a good connection because okay. you know if you can get the DOR staff to kind of take that on, um, you know, it's their they they want to see people in in terms of um, you know giving them the tools that they need to be employed. Excellent. Yes, and I do have a, a contact there, which I didn't even think about them, but I will okay. definitely call them now. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Dolores. Well, thank you. All right, and we have another question that popped up in the chat um, asking, does the board appoint family advocates within counties? Do you know how many family advocates there are within the state? Okay, so um the re the requirement is to have at least 20 percent of the board or commission memberships um, locally um, as family members of individuals with lived experience of mental illness um, that's the requirement locally and then for our statewide um, for cal bhbc's statewide leadership we always work to, to have that type of mix also, you know, so we have the diversity and the same type of coverage. Uh, did that answer your question or did you have a certain thing in mind when you said family advocate that I didn't touch on? Yes, that was me, uh, yeah. Lana, Lana Sawyer. Um, I used to work with a gentleman named Dane Leibart in Orange County, who was a family advocate, and he held the stakeholder meetings. And this was at a time and day years ago when family advocates first went around to all of the behavioral health clinics, introducing the concept that family, that peers had faster and better recoveries when their family members were involved in their treatment, as far as being able to share with behavioral health the issues that their children were having, understanding that it was a one-way share process. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, we were really excited to see SB 803 pass. Um, and I believe it does speak to that, that the family members um, are considered peers also and, and can be part of that um, certification as family member peers. But there so, are no paid family advocates. Oh no, I, th Dame I think that, that can be paid. Um, and and it, right now, you know, before SB 803 was passed, each county was doing kind of their own thing and. And you know, sometimes people that, that were peers, they might have a different title, but they, you know, either that or they were just paid from the county um, or, or through the MHSA, they weren't paid from Medi-Cal. Now we can actually match money so we can get 50% from Medi-Cal in order to pay the peers. Um, right, so MHSA. That's, that's, yeah, the MHSA um, funding. Okay, thanks. Thank and you, then, you answered the yeah, question. Right now we're kind of, waiting to see what the certification process is. It's, it's kind of being created now that, that we've um, passed SB 803. So over the next year, I think we'll see more, um, more process and, and standardization in place. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you, Lana. Okay, and then we have a couple of comments um, kind of addressing the discussion question. Um, so someone from Ventura County says, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, that her sons grew up in Ventura County, um, but ended up in Los Angeles County for the services because there was more available. Um, she notes a specific uh, community residential, um, river community residential treatment. Um, and then, um, conservatorship through LA County as well um, and says that uh, her older son has been in many secure facilities for um, over nine years uh, and then mentions that there are less monthly visits that were allowed before um, due to COVID so she's not able to have those monthly visits um, 
with her sons. Um, and that is, I believe if I understood the, the comment, uh, this individual is in Ventura County with um, sons that are getting treatment in Los Angeles County. Okay. Right. And then somebody else commented um, and just like kind of echoed that, that Ventura County lacks board and cares. So people with um, serious mental illness are directed far from their families. Um, either, you know, places like LA, Long Beach, even as far away as Napa. Right. Yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why we, we've been very active um, and created, we have an issue brief on our website also regarding the board and care issue. Um, people are being uh, sent hours away from the communities right now um, because we don't have enough board and cares and the ones that are, are available, many have been closing um, because of the fiscal model. So there's still more advocacy to do. Um, you know, we've, I mentioned there was some legislation that was just passed that allows counties the first rights in terms of purchasing a board and care that is planning to close. Um, so that's a good thing. And that, that actually is what sparked by COVID-19 um, uh, from funding mechanisms in place that would bring um, funding through Project Home Key and, and allow um, that funding to go through the counties to do that type of purchasing. Um, but there's, there's still a lot of work to do. And, you know, as board members, and I'm a board member here in Napa County, um, you know, we've gone out to other counties to visit the boarding cares um, where our own residents um, live and they've been hours away. Um, some of them are well run, some of them are not. Um, um, so there, there's still a lot of work to do. Thanks for, thanks for mentioning those things. Yeah, thank you to you both. Uh, and then somebody asked what, what was the bill again that you just mentioned, the one that allows um, a city to purchase boarding care? Um, Give me just a minute. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see. Okay, so that one is AB 2377. And it was on um, our slide um, under new legislation. AB 2377. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and I can actually, let me pull that up right now. I can actually drop the link for that bill. Okay, so Good. the link Thank is you. there for, for that one as well. Great. Any additional thoughts related to issues, gaps, or successes in your uh, local areas, or any questions for Teresa? I do want to mention, you know, I, I gave um, some information to Brianna um, in case you need, um, you know, just more information on how to connect locally with your board of commission. Um, she can help with that. Um, and also there's a link to the websites for each of the boards and commissions. Um, and on our website under meetings, we've been tracking where, when the meetings are taking place in each county that, that they, in, if they tell us. Um, so the connection information and the agendas are on our website now too for each of the local boards and commissions. Um, and you know, um, if there are any comments or questions um, regarding in, interacting locally, you know, I'm, I'm happy to um, take those questions as well. All right. Well, thanks so much for all of the, the, I really appreciate the, the feedback on the issues that you care about and um, I've taken some notes today too. So that'll help us moving forward. 
Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much to everyone for sharing your input and for asking your questions. Um, it was really helpful to kind of keep the dialogue moving forward. Um, if you think of anything else that you'd like to share with Teresa and her team, um, definitely just let us know. I'm gonna go ahead and drop uh, my email in uh, the chat. Um, and you can definitely go ahead and just, you know, send anything over that you might want to share um, based on the discussion question that she posed to you all. And then same if you have any questions that kind of come up as you're reviewing any bills or trying to connect with your own um, local boards and commissions um, and any questions come up, you can just pass them to us and then we can let them know as well. Um, so thank you so much, Teresa. Um, this was great. Um, I know folks have been asking for this one for a while. Um, so I'm glad that we finally got to connect. Um, and so just um, some last minute things to wrap up. We do have an evaluation for this town hall. We have one for each of our town halls. Um, and so I'm actually going to drop in the link now um, so that you all can go ahead and take that evaluation. And then we also, um, we were doing the town halls a little bit more frequently when we first started them. I think we were doing them maybe every two weeks, um, but we folks are, you know, on a lot of different Zoom calls. Um, and so we wanted to spread them out. And so now we're, we're having the monthly town halls. Um, and so we're really glad that Teresa could um, come and join us for the Cal BHBC for October's. Um, but we do have another one planned um, for November, um, I believe um, in regard to LPS. Um, which I know a lot of you um, have expressed a lot of concerns and questions around. Um, so if you all would like to join for that, the link is also there. Um, and I don't know why it's not letting me drop this link right now, um, but I will drop the eval and the town hall um, shortly. But as you can see there, you just go to namica.org slash town hall, and it will actually have all of the upcoming uh, events that we have, but also if you missed any of the previous, um, I believe we've had eight now, um, you can access the recordings there. Um, so if you, you know, missed one and you have specific questions, um, or if you know folks who wanted to attend this one, um, but couldn't make it, um, letting them know that the, the recordings will be available then. So um, I'm not sure why it's not letting me, I was dropping things into here fine, but it's not letting me on this one. But anyways, it's it's pretty simple. Um, I see Ragini maybe trying to do it for me in the background. Thank you. Excellent. Oh, yes. Okay, so Ragini just dropped it. And thank you so much, Lana. So Ragini just dropped that link um, for the evaluation. And I see that she is also dropping the town hall. So thank you, Ragini, for uh, keeping the, the session going. So definitely you can just click on those links. Um, feel free to click on them now so that when we end the session, you can continue to work on them and, and look into the upcoming town halls that we have coming up. So thank you again, Teresa, and um, we'll make sure that if we get any feedback from folks that we um, send it your way. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your day um, and we look forward to being in touch.